Anna's going to be putting up uh, the uh, this uh, screen for now, and uh, I just had an update for you. So take a look uh, at this piece. It's actually a liturgical book of gospels made specifically for use in Orthodox church services. Here you see the gospel in two pieces. The text block has been separated from its ornate silvered and gilt cover. Now, the gospel was printed in Moscow in 1681 and housed in the church of St. Theodosius, uh, which was built in the late 1600s and at the time was under the aegis of the nearby Kiev Caves Lavra. The church was badly damaged during World War II, but fortunately it has been restored. I actually wonder if Dr. Brumfield has photographed this particular church and would not be surprised at all if that is the case. Now, um, the cover of the gospel dates to a later period. An inscription on the cover notes that due to its age, it was restored and adapted in, in 1804 by the rector archpriest Johann Aronsky. The painted enamel miniatures were added at this time. Interestingly, on the first few pages of the gospel is this ominous inscription Quote, should anyone dare to remove this gospel from the holy table, he will fall under triple anathema, be distanced from the kingdom of God, and will burn with a heretic Arius in the eternal fire, from which may Christ God deliver all Orthodox Christians, end quote. We do not know who removed this object from the holy table or when, but we certainly hope that this curse does not extend to our museum staff. Unfortunately, time was not kind to this object. As you can see, there was extensive damage to the cover. Two of the enamel rondelles were missing. The remaining enamels were chipped and damaged and the gospel was disbound with loose and torn pages. And of course, we could never exhibit this piece in such a state. So for decades, it has been lying in museum storage. However, earlier this year, we were able to bring this incredible artifact back to life. Thanks to the amazing work of conservators Nikolai Bashmakov of BNNS Company and paper conservator Donya Khan, the gospel was brought back to its former glory. Take a look at the remarkable transformation of this piece. The cover has been cleaned and repaired. The missing enamels have been recreated. The text block has been reattached. So here's a close-up of one of the repaired enamels depicting St. Mark the Evangelist. And actually, when I was asked which of the enamels had been repaired, I honestly couldn't tell without first taking a look at the photos taken before conservation. The, uh, the, the work was just exquisite. Now, here's the gospel with the newly reattached text block. It's open to the first gospel and shown, shows an ornate woodblock print depicting evangelist Matthew. And you can see that the clasps on the gospel have also been recreated and attached. So, now we can finally display this outstanding example of ecclesiastical art. It is so gratifying to be able to bring such amazing treasures to our museum's visitors and to share these stories with you. However, this kind of conservation is honestly quite expensive, which is why we are focusing specifically on conservation and collections care in our spring appeal, which we launched earlier this month. Our goal is to raise $35,000 by June 30th to continue this kind of work. Uh, next month, we'll be marking the one year anniversary of our second Saturday lecture series. And since June, we've have had over 1,000 people attend our lectures. So I'm so glad that many of you have become regulars at our lectures. Um, and if each attendee of our second Saturday lectures gives $35, then the Spring Appeal will be over in a matter of minutes. So I encourage every one of you to please support this initiative. Please give $35 or $100 or $350. Every dollar counts. And um, if each of one can you just can just make a, sim a small contribution, whatever is comfortable for you we can reach this goal and continue to preserve these invaluable artifacts for you and for future generations. So please click on the donate button, which is going to be in the chat box. You can do this now, you can do this uh, later on after the lecture. Please support the Spring Appeal so that we can bring these artifacts back to life. Now, 
Um, thank you for the generosity of everyone who has been supporting us and those who have already contributed towards this fundraiser. So uh, thank you for your attention and we will now get, uh, get to the most important part of the presentation. And it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. William Kraft Brumfield. He is the professor of Slavic studies at Tulane University and began photographing Russia in the 1970s. He is the foremost authority in the West on Russian architecture. He is the author, editor, and photographer of numerous books, most recently Journeys Through the Russian Empire, The Photographic Legacy of Sergei Prokudzin Gorsky. Brumfield is the recipient of a John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Fellowship and was a fellow at the National Humanities Center. In 2002, he was elected to the State Russian Academy of Architecture and Construction Sciences. And in uh, 2006, he was elected to the Russian Academy of Fine Arts. Um, Dr. Brumfield's photographs of Russian architecture have been exhibited at numerous galleries and museums and are part of the image collections at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. So thank you again for joining us today and please join me in welcoming Dr. Brumfield. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, we see the cover of the, uh, the, the book, uh, Journeys Through the Russian Empire, the photographic legacy of Sergei Prokudin Gorsky. The book is a miracle of uh, design of uh, art books. I am enormously grateful to Duke University Press, uh, their superb staff for putting uh, the book together, bringing it off press under the most complicated conditions last summer. That would be a separate story in and of itself. I'm also deeply grateful to Richard and Betty Hedreen for providing a generous grant, which enabled uh, the production uh, of this 528 page book with some 400 color photographs. Uh, this is an immense gift and I uh, cannot find words to express my gratitude to such generous sponsors, donors. Uh, Prokudin Gorsky is well known to all of you, I'm sure, as a Russian photographer and chemist at the beginning of the 20th century, developed a method for uh, color photography. This method had already been begun by German uh, specialists, but Prokudin Gorsky perfected it. And more to the point, he found a purpose for this uh, new invention. It was very complicated, cumbersome uh, camera, but it produced a true color image. We'll talk a little bit about that in just a few minutes. Uh, but uh, usually we think of Prokudin Gorsky's photographs as providing a glorious vision of a Russia that uh, of the past, a Russia that uh, has disappeared, has vanished. As we see in comparing Prokudin Gorsky's photographs and mine taken 70, 80, in some cases a century later, uh, much was indeed preserved despite the cataclysms of the 20th century. But I'd like to say that a comparison and a study, a careful study of Prokudin Gorsky's photographs shows that in fact, he photographed a, um, a Russia that was undergoing fundamental transformation. Uh, it's not some timeless vision of a distant past. In fact, Russia was changing literally before his eyes. And the photography uh, provides us a way to determine history. Uh, in a very, very complex period, not only for Russia, but for the world uh, in uh, general. Uh, so that photography, a photograph uh, conquers space and time. We know where the photograph is, if we have the proper knowledge. Uh, we know when it was taken, if it is properly documented. And my photographs have the dates in which they were taken. It's a part of my scholarly work. And this enhances the artistic appeal, I might add. So that a, a photograph becomes a monument in and of itself, one subject to many and different interpretations, uh, one that can be used to project different messages. We must be careful uh, in uh, our understanding of documents such as the photographs of Prokudin Gorsky and my own uh, a century later. So the photograph, a good photograph is like a poem. It is the beginning of a conversation. And that conversation will be the subject of my talk today. Now, the many paradoxes surrounding Prakuti Gorsis would, continue, would uh, include the fact that although he seems to photograph timeless Russia, monuments of ancient uh, art and architecture, 
uh, peasants working in the field. Remember, Russia was still an overwhelmingly agrarian country at the beginning of the 20th century. It's also industrializing very rapidly. Uh, Krikutin Gorsky used the uh, benefits of that industrialization, for example, railroads. Uh, from 1909, he was uh, enabled by the Ministry of Transportation of the Russian Empire uh, to use water uh, uh, transportation, uh, steamboats along Russia's rivers, for example, uh, or the rail system rapidly expanding with the help of French investment. Uh, he was able to use these methods of a most advanced industrial sort in order to photograph these timeless views of Russia's antiquities, Russian culture, Russia's cultural heritage. So that here you have a paradox in and of itself. Modernization in Russia is already coming full force, although very unevenly. And at the same time, Prigozhin-Gorsky uses these modern um, uh, methods in order to capture a timeless, seemingly timeless past. Uh, secondly, the very camera that he used uh, could not have existed without a very complex and sophisticated educational and research structure. Uh, he himself was a graduate of the Technological Institute in St. Petersburg. He, he worked in various uh, institutes, scientific and scholarly institutes in Russia. This requires a very complex structure that had been developed uh, really since the time of Peter the Great, so that this too. Uh, is an aspect of modernization. All of this contributed to Prakutin Gorsky's remarkable record, fixing in time uh, Russia's culture and Russia's cultural heritage, particularly as reflected in architecture. And then we must also remind ourselves that a photograph is the time machine. It takes us back to a certain period it's properly identified, but it also should stimulate our thoughts, what happened after. Now, my photographs a century later uh, can be seen as a bookend to Prakutin Gorsky's work, but what happened in the, in the meantime? We look at Prakutin Gorsky's photographs. For example, on the cover of the book, over to the right, you see his view taken in 1910, I believe. The precise dates are in the book. Uh, I don't always remember them, but they are absolutely reliable in the captions. This is the famous Nilova Pustin Monastery um, on Lake Siligir in Tver province, taken, I believe the photograph was taken in 1910, uh, but those of you with the book can correct me if I'm off a little bit. Uh, the, over the, the left is my photograph taken in August 2016. What happened in the meantime? If we look at Prakutin Gorsky's photograph, we should bear in mind as the text shows that this monastery, uh, one of the greatest in Russia, was used as a prison, a terrible prison, a point of detention in the 1930s and 1940s. Many lives were destroyed in this monastery, uh, not to mention the, the works of art that the monastery contained. Now it is being revived. My photographs show that process of revival and generation. But what happened in the meantime? So that a photograph allows us to slide along a temporal scale. What happened within 10 years or 20 years after Prakutin Gorsky's photograph? We need to know that in order to more deeply understand uh, the relevance uh, of his superb work to an understanding of the arc of Russian history. So let us begin our conversation that these photographs should stimulate our thoughts about Russia and its history. Uh, first, a uh, image of what is glass negative, is a glass plate looked like. It had three separate exposures. It dropped three times on the camera. Each time it uh, dropped in front of the lens, a different filter was placed there. Including Gorsky always had an assistant working with him. So at the top you see magenta, then you see yellow, then you see cyan or blue at the bottom. So when you combine these three images, as he did when he showed them through a projector, the public slide showings, that's usually the way he presented his work, not his exhibits, but his slideshows. When you combine the two, you get a genuine color image. It's not colorized, it's actually a color image. You have the three separation process, which is the basis of color printing to this day. They have the, the 
the magenta or red, the yellow, and the cyan or the blue. So that's what these enormous glass plates look like. It's a miracle that even two thirds of the collection survived and is now at the Library of Congress uh, through a process that would be the subject of uh, a, a spy novel. You couldn't make this up. The improbable uh, um, uh, tourist twists and turns that brought the Kruding-Gorski collection to the Library of Congress in the late 1940s. And there are many details that we still don't understand. But this is the basis of the collection. These uh, three exposure glass plate negatives that are now housed uh, in a special part of the Library of Congress. Now, if we go to our first journey, there are eight journeys in the book that reproduce geographical areas that Rudingorsky and I explored uh, in Russia. You'll see the splendid St. Demetrius Cathedral in Vladimir built in the late 12th century by Sevalod Yurievich, son of Yuri Dolgoruki, the founder of Moscow. Uh, this uh, church is a a poem in stone with its very detailed carvings. Rakutin Gorsky saw his camera work as a way of fixing Russia's rich cultural heritage, going back to the very beginnings of the uh, Muscovite reign and realm. Now you notice the clouds at the top. You can see a blue, a yellow, and a red fringe. That's because the clouds moved. There must have been, a, have been a brisk wind on the day he took this photograph. The clouds moved as the three part exposure was being taken. Therefore, you see the magenta, the red, the yellow, and the blue. Combining those three, you have a stable color image, but any motion will be separated into three parts in the final image. We can see this later on with some people. Uh, in um, uh, the series that I'll be showing today. This is my own photograph of the same cathedral, also from the Southwest view. I have many photographs, dozens of photographs of this remarkable monument of uh, Russian architecture and art. Uh, but I wanted to give a slightly different perspective from Prokutin Gorsky's. Both he and I photographed it from the Southwest. You can see the elaborate carving, the message in stone, that has been left for subsequent centuries. Church was built as part of a palace complex for a Grand Prince Sivalod uh, Yurevich. And here is his photograph from the south, or the southeast. And you can see there well, in the foreground, a service building with a bell cot and a, a smokestack. It was used to house a boiler that would heat the church in the winter. The Soviets, of course, during their restoration period, eliminated that. Now we think of the Soviet period as one of rampant destruction of, of churches. And in many cases that's true, but churches that were seen as a part of Russia's cultural heritage were carefully maintained even during the Soviet period. For example, in the fall of 1941, at a desperate time when the German Wehrmacht was hurtling toward Moscow, there was a team of uh, archaeologists and restoration specialists working on this cathedral to make essential repairs. Even at that desperate time in the history of the Russian people and the Soviet Union, concern for these landmarks was evident and palpable. Uh, by the way, the church was one of the first to be restored in the 19th century. Nicholas I, Tsar Nicholas I, found it to be a worthy part of Russia's cultural heritage. And one of the first examples of a, an attempt at scholarly restoration of a medieval monument. For example, these gables here were restored during that period. Many of the things that were done during this first restoration of the 19th century would now be unacceptable in current, uh, by current standards. Nonetheless, it is a part of the evolving and enduring history uh, of Russia as reflected in its great architecture. An architecture that we know far too little about in the West, I might add. And this is my own view of the cathedral now. The service building has been eliminated. There are other ways of keeping the temperature regulated in the cathedral built at the end of the 12th century, uh, as I mentioned. 
Now, if we uh, go to the neighboring town of Susdal, uh, this is the Cathedral of the Nativity of the Virgin. Most nativity churches in Russia are dedicated to the Nativity of the Virgin, the Mother of God, uh, Theotokos, as she's referred to. Uh, and this is the three, this is the color image from that three part separation that I showed you at the very beginning. Now, notice that the roof line here is flat. Right? And this photograph, again, taken around 1910, 1909, 1910. The precise dates are in the caption. You can see various other additions that were made in the centuries after the church was built. The church was originally built in the middle of the, at the beginning of the 13th century. Then it collapsed in the early 15th century after a fire caused by a Tatar raid. It was rebuilt during the early 16th century by Ivan III, as a, uh, Basil III, excuse me, uh, signifying Moscow's assumption of the legacy of pre-Mongol Rus, so that it was rebuilt. But the roof line was flattened out in the 18th century, easier to maintain. My photograph, March 1972, shows the roof line restored. This was a, um, a goal of many restoration projects in the Soviet Union after the Second World War, uh, when Russian culture and national heritage were being emphasized so that you could have uh, a more accurate view of the original glory of these buildings. But the, remember the upper brickwork and the cupolas, this was all 16th century rebuilding from the 13th century walls that survived from the uh, devastating raid at the beginning of the 16th, 15th century. So there's so many so much history collapsed in any of these monuments that we see today. Uh, the photograph is the beginning of a conversation. Incidentally, I might add, the snow was so clean in the early 70s. Uh, I, I, I can't remember seeing a snow like that later on. I just, uh, but perhaps I'm, my age is speaking here. Beautiful snow in the early 1970s, March 1970 for this photograph. Moving on, another view of the uh, Nativity Cathedral complex. And uh, let's just, and you see that flat roof line. And let's take my view from 2009, summer day, the clouds. The clouds in Russia are such a remarkable part of the, the aura of these monuments. They play a very important role in my own work as an artist. Of course, I can't command the clouds, but one tries to be in place when they gather. And Rakudin Gorsky was also a great specialist in capturing clouds. There you see the cathedral complex, Cathedral of the Nativity of the Virgin in Suzdal, uh, early 13th century, rebuilt in the early 16th century and the Archbishop's Palace over on the right. Splendid, one of the great cultural uh, sites in Russian history, uh, preserved uh, in, during the Soviet period and now restored with the help of the church. If we move to Smolensk, to the west of Moscow, here we see Perkutin Gorsky's photographs of one of the greatest um, holy relics in all Russia, the Smolensk, icon of the mother of God, or the Smolensk Hadjetria icon, is right there. It was brought by a Byzantine princess in the early medieval period when she married a Russian prince. Some people attribute the icon to the hand of uh, uh, Saint uh, Luke, but still, whatever its uh, origins, it was one of the most sacred objects in uh, Russia's uh, cultural history. It disappeared in the Second World War. We don't know what happened to it. Here it is right here. It disappeared in the Second World War. My photograph of the interior of the same cathedral shows everything in place. The icon is no longer there. Another one, also ancient, was used to replace it uh, in the, the same uh, special uh, canopy. Uh, 
But here we see with my lens, which is much wider than Bergudin Gorski's, the superb interior of this cathedral, which survived Napoleon's burning of Smolensk. It survived the years of German occupation. This cathedral, magnificent uh, Dormition Cathedral on the hill in Smolensk, is also photographed in uh, more detail uh, and uh, discussed in my book, Journeys Through the Russian Empire. But once again, we see what was left and what has been lost. Photographs provide, when they are properly uh, presented and archived, photographs provide a discussion of history. They are not simply there for uh, our uh, admiration, lovely though they are. Another example, to the west of Moscow, the battlefield at Baradino, which Tolstoy, of course, describes in War and Peace in such gripping detail. But this is the Bagration uh, bastion at the center of the battlefield. This is the monument. General Bagration, leader of the Russian forces under uh, a, a Field Marshal Kutuzov, died on this spot. He was buried here. In 1931, this monument was blown up. This is a period of collectivization, of aggressive destruction of cultural monuments. It was blown up, including the grave of Bagration. When I was there in 2012, on the uh, 200th anniversary of the Baradino battle, August of, 2000, of 2012, you can see the monument in the final stages of completion, been recompleted. They actually gathered fragments of the body of Bagration, uh, his uniform, and uh, they uh, were able to uh, recreate the grave and the monument. You see the workers still putting the finishing touches uh, on the uh, uh, monument. I said Bagration was mortally wounded at the battle. Uh, he didn't die on the field of battle, but his remains were brought back here and buried. And now this monument blown up in uh, the uh, early 1930s, the monument that Bakudin Gorsky photographed on the field of battle at Baradino, one of the most sacred places in Russian um, memorial history, now recreated on the occasion of the 200th anniversary of the battle. The photograph tells us something about the evolution of Russia's turbulent history in the 19th and 20th century. This is the church of St. Nicholas in Majaisk near Baradino. The French army sacked this church on their way to Moscow after the battle of Baradino. This is Prakudin Gorsky's photograph. This is mine taken in 2014. And another view, a distant view down the country road and a more lyrical view that I took with the trees framing the landscape, the cathedral on the hill, the shining beacon still there, restored, damaged and sacked by the French in 1812, damaged again during the German attack on Moscow in 1941. Um, Majaisk was quickly liberated that same winter, uh, but much damage had already been done to the church during the fighting in the surrounding area, now recreated and uh, still returning uh, to us this message from the past, which we must decipher by looking and understanding the photographs. And we move to the second journey, uh, the third journey, excuse me, uh, which goes to the Northwest of Russia. We see the church of the Dormition at Ankimova, one of the great multi-dome churches built at the beginning of the 18th century. It is a precursor the famous church at PG, the Transfiguration Church, which many of you perhaps have seen, built in 1714. This was built in 1708. It's a panoply of domes ascending to the uh, peak, the crown at the top. It was burned in 1963. Uh, people uh, were setting, uh, just had a bonfire nearby. The church caught fire, burned to the ground, burned to the ground one of the great monuments of Russia's folk traditional architecture. But because it had been carefully photographed, measured, I was able to recreate it. There is my photograph of its recreation outside of St. Petersburg. Any of you who take the uh, journey from Moscow to Petersburg along the rivers and canals will see this church, a recreation 
off the church at Antimova. Again, photographs fix a monument and allow us, in certain cases, to recreate it, to transcend the destruction, which has so often been the fate of Russian architectural monuments during the 20th century. So there is Perkutin Gorsky's photograph of the church on the Vitigra River in Northwest Russia, in passage from Petersburg to Moscow. Here's his photograph. And here is mine of the reconstructed version, which is outside of St. Petersburg, built at the beginning, reconstructed at the beginning of the 20th century. You might notice, by the way, that the logs are uncovered, whereas in Gorsky's time, the church um, officials considered that it was better to cover the logs with plank siding. It looked more sightly or appealing, so they thought. But these, again, are changes that have to do in our perception of what architecture is and what it should represent. Do you have siding on these superb structures or do you not? There are varied views on that. I, as a photographer, record what's there. I stay out of the controversy. Uh, another church uh, along the waterway. Uh, this is the church at Krohino uh, that so many of you, uh, perhaps who have taken the cruise from Moscow to St. Petersburg, you have, uh, you have seen. Uh, this is Perkutin Gorsky's photograph. Uh, of the church as it existed at the beginning of the 20th century. But then they built dams and hydroelectric projects during the Soviet period, the 1930s, 1940s, the water level of the Sheksna River leading to um, uh, this, uh, the Kobja River leading to White Lake and the Sheksna River. The water level rose and the church was partially submerged. There you see my photograph of this church, the same church, taken in 1991, August 1991. They preserved the church because it was used as a navigation beacon at the top. It was preserved. And here's the photograph that I took in 2005. The waves, elements buffeting the church are almost now to the point of collapse. And yeah, uh, so gripping is the story of this monument uh, in the um, lake or reservoir along the way from Moscow and Petersburg that a society has been created in order to preserve it. They built a dam around it. You don't see here because it hasn't been, been built. So there is a national campaign to save the church half submerged at Krochina on the passage from Moscow to St. Petersburg. Yes, Perkutin Gorsky's photograph of the Nativity of Christ, the Church of the Nativity of Christ uh, at Krochino. So here we have my photograph from 2007, my photograph from 1992, and Perkutin Gorsky's photograph from the summer of 1909. The Church of Krochino that has now become a symbol of national preservation of architectural monuments. Can they stabilize what is left of the church? Attempts are being made. Now, if we go down to White Lake, Yelazersk, the main town at the southern shore, we see this view of children on a levee near the lake. The children are behaving themselves, looking in the afternoon sun toward Perkutin Gorsky. But here is the infant here. I'm not sure we can enlarge. Let's see if we can enlarge it a little bit. Uh, she is not quite as still as the others, the, the sweet, dear little thing. She turns her head so that in the final uh, version of the photograph, you see blue, yellow, and red. Now, each of the exposures in Perkutin Gorsky's photograph shows her face. But the final combined version, anything that moves during Perkutin Gorsky's process, will come out as a tripartite blurred image. But I'd look at that photograph taken in 1910, 1909, and I think, what happened to those children 10 years later? War revolution, terror, famine. What was their fate during collectivization? If they survived the period uh, of the war and revolution and civil war, 
what would have been their fate after. The photograph, again, should cause us not only to marvel uh, at the beauty of this scene, this calm late summer afternoon, but what happened after? What happened to these people that Prokutin Gorski captured? And the church in the background, well, this is my photograph of it right here. St. Paraskeva was ransacked and left to ruin during the Soviet period. Attempts have been made to restore it, but Belozersk, uh, there's not very much money there. It's uh, so, something of a stagnant economy and uh, attempts to restore this church have failed. You can see a tree growing out of the dome at the top. It's my photograph taken in 2007. If I occasionally miss the dates, uh, you have them in the book, Journeys Through the Russian Empire. All right, so let me get, let's uh, see, make sure that we have our power here. And all right, we are restored just in the nick of time. All right, go to Yaroslavl on the Volga River, one of the great centers of 17th, 16th and 17th century Russian culture. Uh, this is the splendid church of uh, St. John the Baptist at Tolchkova, taken by Perkutin Gorsky from the west. This is my photograph taken from the east. Some of the structures that Perkutin Gorsky photographed were destroyed when they built a chemical factory which produced paints in the 1930s during the Soviet period. That factory still exists, by the way. If you get the right angle, as I do here from the east, you can exclude the industrial intrusion and see again what is left. A splendid 17th century bell tower. It's ascending tiers. This is late 17th century. The church itself, one of the most remarkable in all of Russia. Its interior would be the, um, the subject of a special lecture. Again, just showing you how these monuments survive. Photograph and be deceptive. We have to go inside to see what has been done, what has been lost. It's not that the photographs are deceptive, they are only a part of the story. They are the beginning of a conversation. If we go to Kostroma, so closely related, as our friends at the Russian History Museum know, to the Romanov dynasty in its inception, here we see the, um, the Apatyev Monastery, where uh, uh, Michael Romanov, his mother, his family took refuge in the perilous time of uh, after 1612, before the establishment of the Romanov dynasty in 1613. So the Ipatiev monastery, the Hypatian monastery, Ipatiev monastery uh, plays a very important role in the history of the Romanov dynasty. The tercentenary was at, at uh, 1913, Rakutin Gorsky was photographing sites connected with the Romanov dynasty. Of course, so much uh, related to that dynasty is preserved in the Russian History Museum in your collections. Uh, Michael can tell you more about that. Uh, but here we see Rakutin Gorsky's view of the Ipatiev Monastery on the Volga River in Kostroma. My photograph, it seems timeless. The same thing would go back and forth. The domes are, have been gilded uh, recently, otherwise very much of um, what we see in Prokutin Gorsky's photographs is still there. These buildings were added in the 19th century, the cloister buildings. The background, the cathedral uh, dates from uh, the 17th century with additions in the 18th century. Other examples of Kostroma architecture, uh, there's, there's so many extraordinarily lyrically beautiful churches in this area along the Volga River. Just wanted to show Prokutin Gorsky's photograph with this trompe l'oeil or uh, rustication on the exterior and my photograph. I should have uh, had asked them to move the cars. Sorry, I didn't have time to do that. And uh, that is something we will just have to uh, uh, tolerate. It's Church of the Resurrection. But look at the tree. Trees so often frame my photographs like clouds. They play a major part in conveying the aura of these of gifts from the past, these great churches of Russian culture. We go to Yekaterinburg. We're now in the 
uh, uh, sixth journey in our book of the eight journeys. Here we see the central pond. Yekaterinburg got its start as a factory town. We see the Church of St. Catherine, 18th century monument in the center of town, destroyed during the Soviet period. There is what the region looked like now. You can still see the factory pond. This is the great Wysotsky Tower, one of the tallest in, uh, in, uh, outside, outside of Moscow. And there it was on the site of the St. Catherine Cathedral. But if we swing over to the left, here is Prokutin Gorsky's photograph of Ascension Hill, named after the Church of the Ascension at the top. And if we look carefully, at a, um, this is the original version without uh, proper registration, but you can see a re, uh, uh, retouched versions, which are absolutely accurate. And we see here, if we enlarged it, you would see the Apatyev house where Nicholas and his family were murdered on the night of the 16th and 17th of July, 1918. Rekutin Gorsky was here, he photographed in 1910. Strange mystery, the hand of fate, that he would photograph in this view of Yekaterinburg, the place that would be the site of agony in July 1918, the Tsar uh, whom he knew personally. My photograph of this same area, we now see the cathedral on the blood. In the background is the Ascension Church, which Prokutin Gorsky photographed. Now, on the site of the Ipatyev House, a new cathedral has been erected, the so-called Cathedral on the Blood, the Cathedral of the New Martyrs. And it includes the basement of the Ipatyev House where the, the family uh, was shot uh, on the night of 16th and 17th of July. Now, what happened to the Ipatyev House? Well, uh, during uh, 1977, Boris Yeltsin, who was in governor of Yekaterinburg, the de facto governor, they had different terms from it at, at, at that period. He was in charge of Sverdlovsk province, as it was known then. He had the house raised, demolished. A very controversial move, uh, and its motives are still subject to speculation. Then, uh, in the, at the turn of this century, Funds were gathered to build a commemorative memorial church on the site. I remember photographing in 1999, there was just a small chapel and a, a cross here. I didn't include that photograph in the, uh, my, our slideshow today, but I've been tracking this site uh, for uh, many years. Here we have my photograph of 2017. We can show the church on the site of the Apatyev house where the Tsar and his family uh, were, mayor, uh, were Nicholas II all of his family and retainers were murdered the night of 16th and 17th, July, 1918. Again, for Kudin Gorsky, he photographed that site just a few years earlier. The hand of fate, the arc of history. Or if we go to his view of Tabolsk on the Irtysh River in Western Siberia, the superb view of the city with its churches uh, dotting the landscape and the Irtysh River in the background, Irtysh, uh, a, a tributary of the Ob River, one of the three great Siberian rivers. And over here, if we look carefully, we can see the Alexander Chapel and an edge of the Kuklin Mansion, the so-called Governor's Mansion, built in the late 18th century. This is where Nicholas and his family, where they were held from uh, August 1917 until they were transferred to Yekaterinburg in April 1918. Here is my photograph of the Kuklin Mansion. And during the post-Soviet period, uh, there was a museum created here. Here's my photograph of Nicholas's cabinet, the suite of rooms uh, that Nicholas had during his captivity and the family's captivity in Tabolsk in Western Siberia. So once again, Prokutin Gorsky is there years before the final agony of the Romanovs. How to explain this? Well, perhaps we can uh, come up with some sort of rational explanation. Prokutin Gorsky followed transportation routes. These were the routes that Nicholas was and his family were taken along uh, until their final uh, place uh, of uh, 
execution. Uh, but there still seems to be something mysterious here, the hand of fate, when one sees these photographs of an area that would later be so closely uh, associated with one of the most dramatic events in Russian history in the 20th century. There again is the suite of room Nicholas's study at the Kuklin mansion in Tabois. Or if we go to his view of Pair, we can see a rapidly industrializing city. And over here, not visible in this photograph that he took as panorama, is the Karolyov Hotel, where Grand Duke Michael Alexandrovich, Nicholas's younger brother, lived in 1918 before he was taken out, again, under rather murky, mysterious circumstances, in June of 1918, and shot on the outskirts of Paris. You can see now, this is a photograph that I took with a wide angle lens getting underneath the tree there uh, in 19, uh, 2014. And here is the memorial plaque to Grand Duke Nicholas, um, excuse me, Michael Alexandrovich, younger brother of uh, Tsar Nicholas II, the youngest son of Emperor Alexander III. And here you can see the flowers always placed at the memorial uh, tablet uh, on the uh, wall of this building. I know this is very much a um, ob object of interest to uh, Nicholas in his work on Grand Duke Michael Alexandrovich. And then the seventh journey, Rakuten Gorsky also went to Central Asia. He believed in the Russian Empire. The Russian Empire had expanded into what was known as Turkestan in the late 1860s, early 1870s, part of the great game, the face-off with the British Empire in Asia. And of course, uh, the Russians photographed these monuments as soon as they got there, photographed, them, studied. This is the tomb of the great conqueror Tamerlane, buried here at the beginning of the 15th century, after his death in 1405, rather unexpectedly, during a campaign against China. Uh, we can see in Putin Gorsky photographs, a number of the tiles are missing. This is an active seismic zone, this part of the world. Here you can see my photograph of uh, 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 the May 1972. Soviet and Uzbek craftsmen and scholars have recreated the tile work at the top of the dome. I have many other photographs of this, but I wanted to give you this reflection after a thunderstorm a May thunderstorm in Samarkand, the children playing uh, at the uh, carefree uh, at the, amidst the ruins of one of the greatest and most feared conquerors in all history, Hammerlane, who gripped the imagination of all Europe in the 15th and 16th century. That again would be a separate lecture. And then, including Gorsky also photographed the um, the, some of the uh, religious schools, the madrasas, these are Shir Dor Madrasa at the center of Samarkand. Now, this glass plate negative did not survive, but fortunately, Rakuten Gorsky, before the revolution, made contact prints from the magenta exposure of his three part exposure. And he put these in albums. They are all at the Library of Congress. They have been scanned so that we at least see what he saw even if not in the color that he photographed. And here is my photograph of the same Shir Dor Madrasa in Samarkand. One of the great monuments of Islamic architecture. This time when Berkutin Gorsky was there, a part of the Russian empire and subsequently absorbed, absorbed into the Soviet Union. Now after 1991, Uzbekistan is an independent country and has continued the careful restoration of these monuments. The final uh, except journey, journey eight. And I might add, by the way, journey seven, I'm so proud that these Islamic uh, monuments have been able to be published. My work documenting them is not well known. I'm a specialist in Russian architecture. But this magnificent book has allowed me to present, following the footsteps of Bakudin Gorsky, work that I photographed in May of 1972, when those Islamic uh, monuments looked more or less as Krugut and Gorsky saw them, 
with, of course, careful restoration during the Soviet period. The final journey to the north, to the White Sea and the Arctic Ocean, 1916, Russia involved in a desperate struggle, which is not going well for Russia. They're building a railroad up to the town of Mormon, as it was known then, now Mormonsk, in order to more easily access allied war material that's being shipped to the Russian army. Railroad under construction in 1916, completed the beginning of 1917, just as the Russian empire was beginning to collapse. And while he was photographing this railroad, he made a trip uh, over by boat, the short distance, the White Sea, over to the Solovetsky Archipelago and photographed the Transfiguration Monastery, one of the most revered in all Russia. This is his photograph of the East Wall taken in 1916. Again, think what would happen within 10 years. 1921, this became one of the first prototypical concentration camps already used by the secret police to hold political enemies. A great fire sweeps through the monastery, destroys the interiors and central cathedrals. The walls remain. This is my photograph taken in 1998, 1998. How many years is that? That's 80, is my math correct? 82 years after Pogodin Gorsky's photographs. The walls are there, built in the late 16th century. The Central Cathedral Ensemble, who's the main cathedral of the Transfiguration, we'll see it again later, built during the reign of Ivan the Terrible, who favored this monastery before its hegemon fell out of favor and was killed uh, in a episode which Eisenstein's movie Ivan the Terrible displays in lurid drama. But this is the East Wall, as I photographed it, as Perkut and Gorsky photographed it in 1916. Or if we go to the West View, across the Bay of Felicity, the main monastery harbor, this is Perkut and Gorsky's view of the monastic complex from the West. Now, here again, the original glass negative has not been preserved, but thanks to his con album of contact prints, we see what he saw in 1916. This moment of calm, of sublime peace in the midst of a terrifying war that would lead to the destruction of the Russian empire. This is his view from the West. This is my view. 1999, 1999, one of those glorious summer moments here again is the Cathedral of the Transfiguration built during the reign of Ivan the Terrible. Now we can see the roof line has been restored if we compare with the Prokutin Gorsky where you just have this flat roof, part of that post-World War II campaign to restore Russia's na natural a national heritage to their original, presumably original form. There have been many scholarly debates about exactly what form this took, uh, the cupola at the top. But that would be the topic for a separate lecture. Other churches built during the 18th century, this is a 16th century refectory church, the intercession over to the left, but it's there as for Kudin Gorsky photograph. Now the interiors of the churches were being restored when I was there in 1998, 1999. But thank God the exterior scaffolding had been removed. I gather it's been put back up again. It's a continuous process. And there we see another view. There is the ancient mariner we see in the foreground there repairing his boat with a little hopper plate before he sets out. These boats are actually seaworthy because the White Sea is right behind me. This is the Bay of Felicity, the reflection of the monastery, the general view, and here a quotidian detail which brings so much to these timeless photographs. But what about this view? Taken close to midnight after a storm, you can see the absolute mirror smooth surface of the water. Mystical as the monastery rises above it. Uh, words fail me to capture the beauty, the sublime beauty of these scenes. It takes a lot of effort to be there at the right time. 
there you are. The one thing you don't get is the incessant hum of mosquitoes that surrounded me as I was taking this photograph. How Perkutin Gorski dealt with those mosquitoes, I have no idea. But I liberally applied DEET uh, to uh, hands, face, anything else that was exposed. Otherwise, you, you could, they would drive you insane. The hordes of mosquitoes that come out in the summer in these sublime, far northern landscapes. But what about this view? Close to midnight, around the summer solstice, 1998. There again, the Cathedral of the Transfiguration. We want a closer view of that. By the way, here is my view from the southeast, built during the reign of Ivan the Terrible. In my view from a, an airplane. No, this is not a drone. This is an actual airplane, which is bumping up and down as I was taking the photograph, but I had fast film shooting out the window. You see the village. Um, there's not a lot of money in this village, and uh, there has to be constant subsidies in order to keep the people and the schools going here. But in the center, one of the great landmarks of Russian history, as well as Russian architecture. We think about the fate. What happened? Solzhenitsyn tells us in his book, Archipelago Gulag, what happened within this space during the 1920s and 1930s. Now it has been restored, a museum, a monastery, existing in its sublime and enduring beauty. I hope my presentation has given you some ideas of the beginning of a conversation. If you acquire my book, Journeys Through the Russian Empire, you will see historical details uh, of, that uh, give you some sense of the, um, the history after Berkutin Gorsky's photographs up to my photographs a century later. Uh, something that gives us thought uh, about the endurance, the tragedy in many ways that, that Russia endured during the 20th century, a topic that the Museum of Russian History is also devoted to exploring. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Brumfield, for a fantastic presentation and also for all of the work, a decades long work that you have been putting into preserving these monuments. A personal little story of mine is I remember one of your books being on the bookshelf in the living room in, in, in my childhood home and leafing through those images left an indelible impression, especially the crumbling churches. And uh, it, is, it is wonderful to see that some, of, of course, not all are being restored and that is also being documented in your book. So again, I want to encourage everyone to uh, take a look on the Amazon link that has been provided in the chat section by um, Hannah and to encourage all of you to buy this wonderful, magnificent volume of uh, another masterpiece of Dr. Brumfield's uh, work in preservation and bringing these wonderful um, monuments uh, to, to, to the public and comparing them to the photographs of Prokutin Borski. Uh, we will soon begin our question and answer section. So Hannah is compiling some of the questions that have been answered. Please put those in the chat box or in the Q&A section. And uh, I do want to thank everybody again for coming um, to encourage everyone to subscribe to our YouTube channel, which has recordings of past lectures and will also have the recording of this lecture. So please subscribe, please share with your friends. And again, Please support our uh, museum through your generosity by donating to the Spring Appeal. Again, the uh, link has been put into the chat box. Uh, any kind of donation makes a difference. $35, $50, $100. Uh, thank you to the people who have already donated. Some of you have donated uh, during the lecture and I hope uh, to see more notifications of gifts coming in um, by the end of this lecture and in the coming days. So again, thank you for joining us. And Hannah will tell us about uh, some of the upcoming programs and we will venture on into the question and answer section. Thank you again. Thank you. All right, yes, thank you very much, Dr. Brumfield. It was an excellent presentation. I truly enjoyed looking and relooking at these photographs. Again, to our audience, please pick up a copy of that volume. It is magnificent. Excellent photographs, excellent textual components, and a really wonderful essay to conclude. 
So for the question and answer session, uh, I'm going to begin with a question from attendee Agnes, who asks so well, who begins by saying so many beautiful pictures of beautiful churches, and then asks any idea what percentage of these lovely Orthodox churches survived the Soviet period? Uh, it depends on how you define the term survive. Uh, only a minority survived with their interior artwork. Uh, most of them that uh, survived on the exterior survived in the form of the Karaskeva church that I showed you at Belisarsk, uh, where the children had gathered in Prokutin Gorsky's photograph. They were shells crumbling uh, in a terrible state of disrepair because no one had maintained them. Ironically, the best chance of preservation for many of those churches would be if they were used as uh, grain storage because at least they would then keep the roof repaired. Once the roof goes, the building will go. And I've seen this uh, not only with churches, but also with many country houses in Russia. Once the roof goes, the rest of the structure goes with terrifying rapidity. And that has happened and continues to happen in Russia to this day. I think the problem is more acute with uh, the uh, estate houses that we associate with the Russian gentry of the 19th century. Uh, those are in more threat than the churches. Churches are being restored. But how many of them actually were preserved during the Soviet period? Well, I would say if we have 36,000 churches, uh, including monastery ensembles in Russia before the mm, uh, revolution, perhaps half of them survived in one form or another, the other ring built. I should add, by the way, uh, that I also photograph synagogues. I have an entire site devoted to uh, monuments of Jewish heritage and memory in Russia. Uh, that site can be found in just uh, Google uh, William Brumfield uh, Clemson after Clemson University and you will find my site devoted to Jewish monuments, also a very uh, important part of Russia's cultural heritage. I photographed mosques in Tartarstan. Uh, I photographed uh, Lutheran and Catholic churches. I photographed Buddhist dasans. Every place of worship is worthy of respect and Russia is a multi-confessional um, a state, as was the Russian Empire. But the center, of course, are the Russian Orthodox churches for reasons that I'm sure the audience today uh, is well aware. Uh, so I would say a rough estimate is perhaps half of the churches that existed before the revolution survived in one form or another during the Soviet period. Some of them have been rebuilt in their entirety. For example, the famous cathedral of Christ the Redeemer in the center of Moscow. It had to be rebuilt completely after it was blown up in 1931. Wonderful, thank you. So next comment comes from Jane who writes, excellent, greetings from London, thank you very much. How did Congress Library come to buy the photographs from Prokutin Gorsky's family in 1948? So a Prokutin Gorsky question next. Well, there are uh, specialists who have explored this topic. I depend on their work. My emphasis is on the photography, including Gorsky's work as a reflection of the art of photography and how you compare it with my work, which is at the National Gallery of Art, so that we have photography as a, as a monument to history, but also to the art of seeing. So the details of the, uh, the family had, uh, this is Ferdinand Gorsky's second family, uh, they had advertised the, apparently, that the collection was there. Americans were going through the war torn ruins of Europe and trying to restore art that had been pilfered during the Nazi regime, uh, but also looking for other uh, treasures that could be brought back to our country, the people who were willing to part with them. Uh, we had the money, we, uh, but how they found out and why they were even interested. Why were they even interested in Prokutin Gorsky? Why were they interested in these photographs of ancient Russian buildings? Uh, I think uh, these details, we may never know. Uh, we have an official version, but it's something of a miracle, as is so much else connected with Prokutin Gorsky's work. For example, how did he get his collection out of the Soviet Union? We still do not know. We know that in 1930, he was already showing slideshows of his work uh, to the emigre community. And let's acknowledge the role of Russian emigre community 
in preserving the memory of Russian culture, whether that community was in France or in this country, and I'm sure our friends at the Russian History Museum are very familiar with that topic, extremely important that the emigre community preserve a memory of Russian art, architecture, and its cultural heritage. But how Prigorsky got that very, those very heavy boxes of glass uh, negatives, uh, some uh, 2,000 of them, how he eventually got them to, to France, we still do not know the details of that. We know he left, brought his family out. He left with one of his sons in uh, the late summer of 1918. The rest of his family, uh, first family, followed, uh, and he created a life for himself eventually in France. But there are so many mysterious details. We, we again go back to the hand of fate, or as the Russians say, Boji Romesel, a God's design. So that is a brief uh, answer to your, to your question. Uh, the important thing is they are at the Library of Congress and uh, they have now been digitized. I arranged the first exhibit of his photographs in 1986. Digital technology didn't exist that time. We printed them on ectochrome prints, 80 photographs that I chose. Uh, that was the first exhibit of Prakutin Gorsky's work. I remind you, he did not exhibit his photographs as prints. He showed them as slideshows. Uh, uh, there's a much more effective way in his view. Uh, when he was still in Russia. Fantastic, thank you. So going back to this idea of artistry and photography, uh, LS asks, Dr. Brumfield, do you try to match the same time of day as Perkutin Gorsky? Um, do you do time of day comparisons between his photographs and your own work? Thank you very much. Uh, that's certainly a very pertinent question. And no, I don't, I don't really consciously try to set it up. It's just, it's there, it's mystery, it's mystical. Uh, <laughs> it just happens. If you're there and you put in the effort and there are no shortcuts, I've traveled tens of thousands of kilometers in Russia. Many places I've gone back to a dozen times such as Suzdal. But if you're there, the gift from the heavens will eventually be bestowed. That is the best answer that I can give to you. And then you say, oh, Prokhodin Gorsky got that same effect. After all, it's Russia. The clouds are going to be there eventually. Thank you for that question. So speaking of clouds here, the individual writes, thank you first off for a fantastic presentation. Even my seven-year-old son was fascinated by the images and stories and spent the entire hour with you. Uh, incidentally, he is wondering how you managed to capture the aerial photograph of the monastery so clearly since the plane was in motion while you were photographing. Well, I was using 200 speed ectochrome film and uh, <laughs> You don't want to see the photographs that didn't turn out, but you just have to keep clicking there at that little window. It's a little crop plane. And um, again, you know, photographing in Russia is a continual act of grace. Grace is bestowed. Grace is bestowed. It was a very bright, sunny day. That helped. 200 speed film. Those were the days before I was working with a digital camera and it just worked. I kept looking through the, once I got the slides developed, oh, this is not so good. And then finally that eureka moment, this one works. So there's a lot of trial and error, persistence, stubbornness, uh, my young friend, be persistent. <laughs> That's the good answer. All right, thank you. So I think that this is going to conclude today's Q and A. So Thank you again, Dr. Brumfield, for this presentation and for your willingness to answer all of the audience's questions. Um, I'm going to end things now by referencing our upcoming programs. Uh, next month's second Saturday lecture will take place on June 12th. It will be presented by Dr. Pamela Jordan, who will present Stalin singing Spy. 
Uh, we also have another program for this month, if you're still interested in May programming from the museum. And it's going to be a Zoom live chat with curator Nick Nicholson and executive director Michael Perekrestov titled Talking on Eggshells, uh, having to do with Easter symbolism and other objects in the museum's collection. So more information is available on our website if you're interested in learning more about these programs. And I'll give one final round of applause virtually to Dr. Brumfield and one final thank you to members of our audience. Uh, have an excellent afternoon, evening, morning, et cetera, and we will see you all next time. Thank Bye you. now.